Yes, I can hear you as well. Fantastic. And we should have Erez online as well. I mean. All right. So thank you again, guys, for joining us. It's really appreciated. And it's um, a great honor to have you both join this webinar as well. We're really fortunate to have some excellent coaches on this webinar as well. Um, so thank you very much in advance. It, it was to the point one of my former coaches actually rang me up and she said that, that she'd actually stayed at your house, Anson, Gemma Granger. So she asked me <laughs> to give, give her a shout out and say thank you for the books again. Uh, well, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, she's a wonderful uh, young woman. Uh, we enjoyed hosting her. Oh, nice. Thank, thank you very much again. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Erez. Um, so Erez is the like the chief innovation officer for Playmaker. And he also spent 15 years as a head of uh, research for Nike um, over in Portland. So Erez is going to lead the Q&A for you guys as well. So I really appreciate your time and I'll lead over to Erez. So thank you guys in advance. Our pleasure. Thank you very much, Steve. And I echo uh, Steve's uh, words that it's an honor and it's a pleasure to have you both uh, on the program today. We've all seen how much the women's game has evolved, but uh, you were two of the uh, founding fathers of the women's game with so much experience. And uh, I'll get the right to the questions. Uh, first, to you, uh, Coach Hansen. Uh, early in your career, you coached both men and women. And uh, eventually, you transitioned to full-time uh, women's coach when you took over the women's national team. You also won the first World Cup ever with women. Can you tell us a little bit about your transition as a coach from uh, the men's game to the women's game or to full-time women's game, please? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, I had no ambitions uh, to coach the women's team. In fact, uh, I had no ambitions to coach. Um, I was uh, uh, a young man that uh, wanted to work for my father. My father was starting his own oil company. He wanted me to be his corporate attorney. And so I love my father. I was a dutiful son. I went to law school for him. Um, the men's position at, at North Carolina where uh, I was attending law school opened up and it was a chance for me to uh, work uh, part-time as the head men's soccer coach at UNC and also get a law degree. And so that's what I was going to do. And all of a sudden it's, I'm graduating from law school. I've got six courses left to get the degree. And my athletic director uh, grabbed me and said, Anson, I want you to come look at this women's club that is petitioned for varsity status here at UNC. Do you mind coming to look at them for me? So I said, no problem. I went out there to look at this team. And my AD asked me about him. I said, well, it's very well organized, um, um, very impressive. And I was hoping to sort of encourage him to establish it as a varsity and then hire the coach that had done a great job with the team to coach them. And then he said, well, Anson, uh, if you will coach both teams, the men and women, I will make your part-time men's coaching position full-time. So basically, uh, <laughs> it was a great opportunity, you know, to, to make more money. So I said, absolutely. I hadn't finished my law degree yet. And so I'm in my final year of law school. Uh, I've only got six courses to go to get the degree. And of course, I'm getting four to six hours sleep at night because coaching two teams is overwhelming, especially as a full-time law student. And I came home one day, and my poor wife, uh, <laughs> when she married me, was going to marry this wealthy corporate attorney. And then all of a sudden, I come home one day, and, and I tell her that, uh, you know, honey, uh, I'm, I'm going to drop out of law school. I love this coaching gig too much. So then I coached both teams together for uh, uh, 10 years. And then in uh, 89, I just started doing the women. So my transition into the women's game was sort of a back door. My transition into coaching was sort of a back door, but honestly, I look back and I don't regret one day I have spent in this wonderful game. Amazing story. Uh, did you ever finish your law degree? No. In fact, uh, all the chancers that worked for <laughs> over the years were dying for me to finish the degree because obviously when you've got an athletic uh, department that's married to the academy, like you know, all the American right. universities are, uh, it would have been very cool for them to say, oh, and by the way, our, our soccer coach, uh, you know, has a law degree, you know, that would have made, you know, that would have embellished the academy even more. And, uh, but gosh, I hated law school. I was only there because I loved my father and, you know, it just, it drove me nuts. Uh, the only thing I liked about it was arguing with everyone. I'm very good at that. Um, but other than that, gosh, I hated the research and, 
And you'll love this. For the first uh, 10 years of my marriage, uh, one of my friends who finished the degree and was starting his own law firm uh, used to bring me uh, and my wife out to dinner uh, on New Year's Eve and show my wife the enormous amount of money he was making. If I would only partner with him, I could share that with him. And he said, I didn't have to do any real work. I just had to show up in court and open my mouth because he knew I hated to do any research, but he, he thought my verbal agility would you know, sustain his law firm. But uh, uh, I hung in there like grim death and never joined him. And uh, honestly, I've lived happily ever after. We are uh, certainly uh, privileged and happy that you used your uh, verbal abilities to motivate uh, women players and men players over the years uh, and to, to, to do so much for the game. Thank you, Coach. Um, coach Randy, to you, please. The next question is to you. Uh, you've coached successfully for many, many years, and uh, you won national championships as well. And um, you are still, from meeting you, I, I know you're still very much uh, inspired to learn, inspired to use uh, new tools, new technologies, learn. How, how is your coaching philosophy has evolved over those years? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, thanks again for having me, and, and uh, thanks to PlayerMaker for putting on this um, podcast for all of us. It's been really good today to, to hear all the different people speak. But um, I think one of the things for me is, much like Anson, when I started out, um, I also was on the boy side to begin with. Back, back in those early days, um, you really couldn't make a living coaching youth soccer. You couldn't make a, a living unless you taught in a high school and, and was a teacher or, uh, or you coached in the collegiate game. So I, I also started coaching men and women uh, as well as a collegiate coach. And I think, you know, in those early years as a coach, when I kind of look back at a, at a coaching philosophy, I think like many young coaches, you know, we had this, these ambitions of where we want to end up at, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years down the road. And I think in those early years, quite honestly, I didn't have the maturity to understand the bigger picture about coaching. Uh, to me, it was all about trying to win games, and, and I felt like that was how I was going to kind of establish my legacy, is it was all about, you know, how many games we could win and how many championships we could win. And I think as we get older, and we kind of get a little bit more um, educated and, and understand a little bit more what all goes into coaching in particular, we learn that those things are a byproduct of of everything else we do, you know, and I think I, I was able to learn over the years that um, first and foremost, the game has obviously changed and continues to change and evolves. And I think if we don't continue to educate ourselves and stay on top of new trends and, and, and uh, new techniques and, and teaching and so forth, that uh, we become stagnant and um, we, won't, we won't have that success. So I've always been very open minded to continuing to be a part of the educational system. I think Anson and I both taught the U.S. soccer coaching courses for many, many years and, and, and then transitioned into the NFCAA, uh, coaching those courses. And so I, I know coaching education has been a big part of, of both of our lives. Uh, but I think, I think that's the biggest thing is, is learning that, you know, I get as much satisfaction now seeing the success of our kids really off the field as I do on the field. I mean, it's, it, we've graduated some fantastic young women and men over the years that are doing wonderful things in life right now. And I, I think once a, a coach can kind of get the bigger picture um, of what coaching is all about, that it's not just wins and losses, I think everything else starts to fall in place. So, you know, I've continued to learn. I will say this, um, you know, we were, very fortunate in my early years to have some good mentors. And, and quite honestly, Anson was one of those. Um, and um, I think that, you know, as, as time evolved, I was fortunate enough to have some very good programs. We had a very good teams when I was at university of Notre Dame and, and won a few championships and played in a few more. And, and, um, but I think even since those days, uh, my philosophy about the way I think the game should look, uh, has continued to change. And I'm doing things today at the University of Pittsburgh that I never would have thought about doing when I was at Notre Dame. 
uh, and or the four years I had in the pros with the Houston Dash. I mean, those, those things have all been teaching tools to me. And I think I've continued to get better and better. And quite frankly, as much as a young coach, I would have loved to have been coaching at a really high level. Uh, looking back over it now, I, I, there's just no way I would have been prepared for that. So um, I think that's how the philosophy, you know, has changed. It's just that you have to, you have to watch people and you have to, to learn from others and you have to be open to new ideas. And then you, f- you find what you think you feel like the game should look like and you implement those ideas that you've kind of picked up from others and you implement your own ideas and, and, and then stay true to what you think the game should looks like, should look like. And, and, uh, and make sure you have a way to, to uh, have that rapport with your kids to get them to buy in uh, what you think uh, your team should be doing. And I think that's really where we've had the most success over the years is having a real good ability to, to get our kids to buy in uh, to the way our staff feels like the game should look. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, one of the things I can relate to, one of the things that, that you said, Randy, uh, when one, in one of my first conversations with my high school coach, he told me our success is not measured just by uh, championships and medals, but also by, by how many doctors and scientists and teachers uh, nurses, our program uh, produces. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. But back to you, Coach Anson. Uh, you've uh, developed uh, and seen probably the largest amount of uh, superstar female athletes uh, in, in the history. When, based on your experience, when you see a, a young female player, what is, in your opinion, the first sign or indication for a future superstar? Well, first of all, uh, <clears throat> let me eliminate any mysteries that are out there. I've made so many mistakes uh, in <laughs> player selection. Uh, uh, I want to apologize for being the one to answer this question. So uh, please don't think I've got some sort of incredible insight into who's going to be extraordinary because I don't. Um, I've got a drawer filled with recruiting failures of full scholarship athletes that I brought in to play for me at North Carolina that I couldn't even get on the field. So uh, I am disqualifying myself from being qualified to answer that question in any way. But let me share this with you. Once a kid does come in, uh, we're pretty good at sorting out uh, what their potential is going to be. And it comes down to player conferences where we parse these qualities. Uh, We talk about self-discipline. We talk about competitive fire. We talk about self-belief. We talk about love of the ball, love of playing the game, love of watching the game, grit and coachability. And we actually try to create a a narrative that's the truth for the player because we actually have the player evaluate themselves in all eight of those different categories. And we uh, actually put a numerical system to make it very simple for them to sort out where they stand. Because what we want them to know is on their current rate of effort and commitment to those eight categories is going to determine their future. So we say, okay, uh, uh, looking at self-discipline, a five, if you give yourself a five, you're saying you're an Olympic caliber or U.S. full team caliber player in this category. If you give yourselves a 4.5, you're a professional caliber player in this category. If you give yourself a four, you're a UNC uh, women's starter. Uh, 3.5 is a kid that plays in every game. Uh, Three is a kid that travels and, you know, 2.5 and below or, you know, kids that can't even make the traveling team. So what you're trying to do in this conversation with the player is to see if they have an honest narrative. Because one of the biggest problems uh, we have in player development uh, is the player that doesn't really understand all the different boxes they have to check to become elite. And then this conversation you're having with this player is also critical because most players hide behind a narrative that protects them from pain and accountability. And the way they hide from this is usually they're in some sort of collusion with their parents or with a former coach that feels like uh, they're just not developing to the extent they should be because the current coach, in this case, it would be me, isn't really helping them get to their potential. And so this is a very important conversation because if I can get that athlete's narrative to the truth as fast as possible, and they take full responsibility for where they are, but also where they're going, that's the player that has the potential to be a future superstar. But honestly, uh, I don't really have an 
an absolutely accurate assessment of whether or not going to make, make it immediately. Now, we've made some good guesses. Uh, I picked Mia Hamm for the national team when she was 15. I picked Christine Lilly for the national team when she was 16. I'm talking about the full team, not one of the youth teams. I picked uh, Julie Foudy for the uh, uh, full national team also when she was 16. And uh, B Field and several others in their late teens. But um, I would pretend to hide behind those successes because those athletes were so extraordinary at a young age, anyone could have selected them. It's the player development path and convincing the player to have the right narrative that's the challenge in coaching and also the only surefired way of trying to get someone to their potential. Uh, so for me, uh, those eight categories are the most critical things to uh, uh, parse and discuss with the athlete in a very serious and aggressive way. Thank you, Ensign. Thank you for sharing with us, the, honestly, the successes and the, uh, the ones that uh, weren't predicted so well. Uh, let's shift now, uh, Randy, with you to current times. These are unusual times, and uh, we were supposed to be in the middle of uh, spring semester, spring training, some friendly matches. How are your players keeping in shape uh, during those times? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I tell you what, for us, it was a little bit different maybe than some others around the country. And when I say others, I'm, I'm really referring to college programs and universities around the country uh, with our seasons because we actually um, were on spring break a little bit earlier than others. So our kids were actually out um, for the week of classes that the virus really hit the country. And so we had to do things a little differently because basically our university, that week that the kids were away, the university basically shut down that week. And so we were scrambling to contact all the kids and get them to understand that we did not want them coming back to campus. Uh, obviously they had all kinds of issues that we had to deal with. They had to be concerned with all of their things that were in the dorm room or their apartments, how were they gonna get them? Uh, what were we gonna do about classes? And everything was transitioning to online academics and so forth. So we kind of felt like as a staff, the first thing we really needed to do is, is once we could kind of uh, walk them through the process and put their mind at ease and get them sorted out with their classes and, and with what was gonna happen the rest of the spring, we really, felt like we needed a couple of weeks just to work on their mental fitness more than anything, because as you mentioned, this is unprecedented for us all. Nobody in the world's lived through this before. And, and I think it's one of those things that um, we were really concerned about the welfare of our kids just mentally and how they were going to cope with it. So the first couple of weeks of the transition of us all being away, uh, we pretty much just were having, just like we're doing today, we were having these Zoom meetings with our team and, and really just not really talking soccer, but just trying to find out what was going on with them, how their families were doing. Um, you know, we've got some kids in England and some kids in Spain and some kids in Canada. And so we let them share what was going on in their respective countries. And I just felt like the most important thing was to take a step back from the football side of things. And, and just make sure our kids were, were okay and, and, and in a good place mentally. So we did that for a couple of weeks and um, got everybody, I think, settled down and, and, and made sure everybody was in a good spot. And then after that, uh, it gave our strength and conditioning staff, which do a fantastic job for us, by the way, it gave them some time to put together um, some individual fitness activities that the kids could do, um, you know, at their homes uh, in social distancing. And um, so uh, Tyler Carpenter, our strength coach, uh, was great. He's been sending them um, information weekly of, of things that they can do and, and, and a plan that will kind of keep them progressing to where we want them to be physically when we do come back. Uh, and then I think our staff's been great um, uh, with putting together some activities for our kids uh, to um, to do individually with with the ball, you know, at home as well. So that we feel like we're in a pretty good spot um, compared to where you know everybody is in the country. I'm sure what we're doing is very similar to what 
uh, Anson and others are doing with their kids. And, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is um, uh, being careful, you know, when we come back. I think that's going to be the big piece is, is how we transition back into, uh, into playing again. But that's, that's really kind of how we've handled this so far. Thank you, Randy. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, following up on your last uh, sentence and uh, turning to uh, Coach Hansen. What do you think should be the strategy, Coach, for uh, return to training? Well, uh, as Randy was sharing, and by the way, uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, what Randy was sharing earlier about our connections as we went through the uh, uh, coaching system uh, um, in the United States. Um, I've always respected everything he's done. Uh, in fact, he and I are colleagues now and trying to uh, sell the country on the women's side to go to the men's 21st century model for a two semester platform for player development. So thank you, Randy, for your leadership uh, in uh, the women's game in the United States. Um, what we're doing right now actually is uh, uh, we are sort of modeling our current UNC team after the team that we trained to try to win that 91 world championship. Because back in the old days, uh, we didn't really put much money into the women's national team. So what we had to do, since we couldn't get together on a regular basis to train, and since back then there weren't professional leagues for our women to play in, uh, we developed this thing that we called self-coaching. So we tried to uh, talk to our players on a regular basis in the training camps about what they should do when they return to wherever they were. Because keep in mind, they weren't returning to an elite professional environment. Uh, they were returning almost to a, a home with a backyard or a, an apartment with an elementary school down the street. And they had to figure out a way to train on their own. And so we have sort of taken this UNC team that obviously can't train right now together and we've asked them to sort of model themselves after the uh, team that was preparing to compete in that 1991 first women's world championship. And so the qualities you need are the qualities I talked about earlier, uh, which is the capacity to train on your own, to stay fit on your own. Uh, and so uh, we are very serious about uh, the stuff they're doing with our strength coaches, just like Randy was saying they do with their strength coaches. Uh, and there are a lot of advantages, actually, to the environment we're in right now, if you think about it. And one is, you know, holy cow, uh, do these kids and a lot of our kids, the elite players, are so busy on a year-round basis, they don't get a break. They go right from a collegiate season into a U-20 uh, World Cup qualifying uh, uh, a platform to an opportunity to maybe uh, uh, train with the U.S. full team uh, into training with pro teams in the summer and then back to their college teams in the fall. They don't really get a break. So what I do like about this right now for the truly elite player is they have a bit of a break to recover physically, but we don't want them to sort of stay on the same level. So our emphasis is to do the stuff you can do on your own. And obviously uh, one of the best things we recommended our kids to do back in the day, pre-1991, was to play 1v1. That was the training platform for the success of the United States in the 1991 World Cup. Because all of these young women that we picked were extraordinary 1v1. Back in those days, we played a 1-3-4-3 a, a three, three with two marking backs and a sweeper. We played a high-pressing game. And of the players in our front seven, six out of the seven were extraordinary 1v1. And there was a reason for that. And the reason for that is we couldn't get together on a regular basis and, you know, spend a half a uh, our time, you know, uh, training ourselves in possessional games or changing the point of the attack or this, that, and the other thing because we couldn't get together. So what could we do on our own? Well, we could play 1v1. So Karen Jennings used to play her, her boyfriend at the time, her current husband, a guy by the name of Jim Gabera, who was the captain of the U.S. futsal national team. And holy cow, was that good for Karen? She was the gold ball winner in 91 because playing against her extraordinary husband, 1v1 all the time, made her one of the world's greatest dribblers. Michelle Akers was dating a guy that ran shooting camps. And so her stuff was about striking balls with power. And they did these camp stuff right through the summer. So what we had to do in preparation for that particular world championship was to have these kids, you know, work on a wall with the ball to develop power and a first touch. I work in racquetball courts to turn and penetrate with the ball. And all of this individual training, which is exactly where we are right now with this coronavirus issue. 
And so we've challenged our kids uh, uh, the way we challenged them in 91. You got a chance to get better. You have a chance to get, you know, 1% better every single day in all these different areas. And here are the ways to do it. And we've been sharing that with them uh, with the hope that uh, when we crawl out of this mess, uh, we're not just going to be um, <laughs> at the level we were when we crawled into it. Our ambition is to be better. It's a great story. I love this story because uh, I think that uh, in addition to the break that they're getting, it's also the 1v1 story will uh, bring uh, more uh, creativity to the game and uh, perhaps uh, in the first season or so, less uh, focus on, on tactical aspects perhaps and more on the creativity of the players that have been away for so long. I also love the efforts that both of you are doing to spread out the uh, college system uh, to, uh, in terms of uh, load monitoring and load distribution and also the opportunity for the, um, for the kids to, uh, to study, uh, not to have so much pressure during the, the fall season. I think it's a great idea and I hope uh, that, that this will happen. Uh, question to you, Coach Randy, which, what kind of adjustment are you making for recruiting these days with travel restrictions and ability to see players? Well, I, I think the one positive thing about this is that under our governing body, the NCAA, um, the guidelines that they set uh, are the same for, for all of us. So nobody's got, you know, a real advantage over some of the basic rules regarding uh, recruiting at this time, as, as many people may know. And I know you've got a lot of foreign-based coaches on today, and, and they may not be quite as aware of the – U.S. collegiate system, but, you know, for example, they, they have um, taken away the ability to sign players until the 15th. I think um, uh, players right now aren't able to make campus visits and, and so forth. And, of course, all the youth soccer around the country has been shut down, so we can't go out, um, obviously, and, and watch kids play and, and, um, and evaluate talent and so forth. So I think a lot of the changes now that have come about um, really, I think, comes down to a couple of things. You've got one age group since recruiting here happens a little bit earlier. It's not like the early years when Anson and I started, we used to recruit uh, high school uh, seniors to go to our universities. And, and over the years, uh, you know, this has gotten earlier and earlier. Um, which is part of the reasons that the NCAA has come in and made some, some rules uh, regarding recruiting lately. And one of those obviously being that we can't uh, correspond with players uh, until June 15th of their going into their junior year. So um, all of us right now really are kind of in the same boat with that class of players that are getting ready to become uh, the rising junior class. Uh, all of us really haven't been able to have contact with those players or uh, especially with the virus we haven't been able to go out and, and, and watch those players since this is, has occurred but I do think that a lot now when the June 15th comes open I think a lot of coaches will be um, reaching out via you know online and, and um, obviously this becomes a bigger piece because none of us knows you know really when we're going to get back to normal um, so I think we've had to adjust a little bit of trying to find ways to uh, still present our program to those kids and get them to hear from us and see what it's all about without them actually being able to come on to visit your campus. Um, and, and for us at this point in time, not being able you know, to go out and see them play. I think the kids that are at the age that we can be communicating with, I think most of the coaches around the country have kind of continued, uh, you know, via email or, or, or text or phone calls or whatever, um, you know, to, to stay in touch with those players um, that, that we've been recruiting that, are, that, we're, that we're able to communicate with them. So it's just a, it's a change from a standpoint that I think what it will do for some schools is, um, you know, some are a little bit more prepared knowing those kids that they're really interested in for this 2022 class that's coming in. Um, and others aren't as prepared and I think uh, there's going to be a little bit of a scramble and there'll be some some players that may feel like they're a little bit behind the eight ball um, of being late in the process but the good thing is for all those players out there 
all of the universities were in the same boat. So um, I think it's, it, it's a situation where everybody's just trying to um, grasp the fact that we can't see these kids firsthand. And, and then if we're still in this lockdown mode through the summer, um, then obviously leagues have to make decisions what they're going to do. And I think the club coaches and the high school coaches around the country have been phenomenal. And um, I think they've been really good about, you know, uh, staying in touch with the college coaches and kind of letting them know what's going on with their, their clubs and, and respective, you know, players that, that universities may be looking at. So I think we're all going to have to work a little bit more closely together um, in those regards, the longer the virus goes on, but it certainly has changed a little bit of the dynamic for sure with the recruiting process. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for uh, sharing your thoughts on this with us. The last question is for uh, both of you, uh, one at a time, and it is, what would be your first tip for uh, a young soccer coach? Go ahead, Anson. Oh, thanks, Randy. Yeah, what I would, uh, I guess I'll, I'll twist this uh, question into the direction I want to I go anyway. <clears throat> My first tip for a young soccer coach, and by the way, I'm going to make sure this young soccer coach is coaching the ages between, let's say, 6 and 12, uh, would be your main function as a coach is to make sure the kids that you're training fall in love with the ball, fall in love with the game, because if that is something you can successfully do with all the kids you're training and that band, that age group, those are the ones that are going to end up becoming elite. The most critical coach in a player's life is that coach that convinces them that, my gosh, this is the way I want to spend my time. I absolutely love the ball and love the game. And, of course, the way the coach does that is by coming into every session enthusiastic, so excited to see all their kids, whether they're 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, or 12. They're so thrilled to be there with them, and they bring the balls out in the whole session – these kids are doing nothing but having the time of their lives uh, with a soccer ball. And uh, that coach, that's the coach that truly develops the elite player. Because by the time the rest of us end up with these kids, when they get older, it's that coach that's inspired this kid to be so good with the ball, to have this ball mastery that will separate them for us. And so the real work in our game is done by that kind of coach. And so the trouble with our country is we emphasize the older ages and the tactics and the shape and the, the this, the that, and the other things. And that's not where the real work is done. The real work is done by that extraordinarily passionate coach that's so enth enthusiastic about the game that convinces this kid, boy or girl, to fall in love with the ball and the game. Uh, so uh, my first tip is, yeah, be that kind of coach and be that kind of inspiration. I, I would, love it. Yeah, I would, I would echo that totally with what Anson's saying. And, and I, I just would add this real quickly. So I'll, I'll kind of go on top of what Anson said, and I'll speak to it from, a, from an educational standpoint. And, and I would just say this, the fortunate thing for young coaches out there today, much different than it was for Anson and I, is there are so many um, online resources. There's so many podcasts and, you know, the, the, the access to the internet you can find, for the lack of a better word, you can find drills and activities for just about every topic you could ever imagine in our sport. And, and I think that's great. There's, there's so many more resources out there for the young coach today. But what I would say to those young coaches, too, is that um, just like they, when they go through a coaching education course, they can't just replicate a drill that they see or an activity that they see and expect that to be coaching. It's, it's all about how you, you know, how you interact. What, what are, what are the, the coaching points that you're bringing out? So the thing I would say to you is the young coaches, number one, coach as much as possible. I think Anson and, and would, would agree with me on this. We were really lucky in a lot of ways that we did coach two programs at the same time. As difficult as it was, we got double the coaching at a really young age. So get out and coach teams. You, you need to learn to manage parents and players and, and uh, situations that may arise as a coach. But then I think really important too is watch others coach because you and I could take a practice session and both go implement that practice, but it's how we 
um, communicate the, the theme or the ideas that we're trying to get across to our players that makes the difference in your practice. So I, I think you need to go watch coaches work. And, and, and as a younger coach, I watched what Anson did and I watched what other coaches around the country that were mentors. Um, and I watched how they interact and presented the topics. And so it's, it's much, much more than just getting the information. It's how you present it. So I think you, you learn by, by watching others as well. So I would encourage young coaches to do that also. In addition to what Anson was saying about coaching the young age groups and the importance of that. Thank you so much, Randy. And thank you so much, both of you. I can't thank you enough for joining us uh, today, for sharing your thoughts, your insights. It was brilliant. I'll just share a quick story with both of you. In uh, last year, 2019, during the World Cup, I've been uh, watching women's soccer for the last two decades. And last summer was the first time that I was watching on TV the women's game. And at the same time, there was a major men's tournament. And I flipped from the men's tournament to the, win to the women's game because I felt it was more exciting. And I think both of you has a lot to do with this that uh, transitioned us to, to, to fall in love with the women's game. So thank you very much for today. 